Recently on the channel, we've been talking a ton about the Super Mario 3D All-Stars because A, they recently got announced, and B, they're about to release. They release in pretty much under a week now, and that's just crazy to me. However, to be fair, as I'm sure many of you guys know, the 3D All-Stars was not my most anticipated game coming out of that anniversary direct. That honor obviously goes to Super Mario 3D World plus Bowser's Fury. It's kind of weird then that I haven't made a single video about about that since the Direct aired. Well, to be honest, I just needed time. The 3D World portion of that trailer showed off so many changes. I have a running list of all the changes I've noticed so far, and there's at least 20 of them, some being pretty major and some being minor. If you guys want to see a video of me going over all those changes, I would guess comment down below, but that is not what we're here for today. Instead, I want to take a moment and analyze, discuss, and present to you guys my theory on the Bowser's Fury portion of the trailer. This Direct aired over a week ago now, and it's taken me this long to come up with a theory that I'm confident in saying I truly believe in. And today, I'm gonna share that theory with you guys. There will be different chapters of this video linked in the description. The first section is a brief frame-by-frame -frame analysis of the Bowser's Fury trailer. The second part is going to be a discussion on how big I think Bowser's Fury will actually end up being. And the third and final section is my final ultimate theory on what Bowser's Fury is based on the 20 odd seconds we got from that trailer. Again, I would have loved to bring you guys this video earlier, but I didn't want to make a theory on something I didn't truly believe in, and it took me about a week or so to come up with something that I truly think is right. With that out of the way, let's get into the first section, the analysis. So as I'm sure you all know, the Bowser's Fury portion of the trailer starts with this plus sign. As the plus sign fades into darkness, we zoom into our first section. It's a little bit blurry, but you can still make out this very distinct line here. This line in the water is what I believe to be the playable area, and you can see it wrap all the way around back here. I think you'll be able to walk in this space, but not over here. I also think when you first enter the Bowser's Fury mode, however you end up doing that, you will spawn on this part right here. This seems to be a peninsula with no other entrance. It also perfectly leads to the first of many cat-themed arches. As we take a look at this first body of land, you can see a very heavy reliance on these graded platforms. These platforms function as nice obstacles, and an interesting way to use the cat gimmick which will likely be very important to this mode. You can see a wide question block at the start of this level, which in my opinion almost definitely houses one of those cat power-ups. In order to pass this first part, you likely have to climb up the graded section, head back behind the structure, presumably platform up it to the top, and then make your way across this bridge with the rotating graded platforms up to the top with this structure that we can see is another cat-themed lighthouse. In fact, we can see at least two more of these in the trailer. One under this archway on the zoom-in, and another one right here in plain sight as we pull into the final shot. On top of that, each of these lighthouses seems to be the end of a corresponding mini level, the start of which is signified by these cat-themed archways. We can see the second lighthouse's archway right here, and the third and final one once again is right in the background in our final shot. So this first level we see clearly has a reliance on these graded platforms. While we can't really figure out what the core mechanic is of this second section, the third one seems to be quite obvious. It's these bouncing orange mushrooms that give you a boost. First of all, you can see this sign with an arrow pointing upwards. On top of that, you can see the side of the orange platforms right here, and you can even see the brief top of one right there. So you'll presumably go through the archway, up there, loop back around, then somehow make it to the top and make your way over to the lighthouse. Last but not least in this original analysis, there's the giant cat statue that the shot closes out on. There's really nothing super special to point out here, everything that I could mention just ends up falling into the more theory side of things. However, one objective fact I will mention is that you can see the actual cat bell section of it is coated in this black substance that has these little cones protruding from it. These cones look eerily similar to the ones that border the entire section, and a weird black goopy substance with cones protruding out of it is literally the exact same as the logo for Bowser's Fury. Last but not least in this analysis, there's just an absolute ton of things that have cat-like themes. Literally everything here is a cat, from the trees, bushes, archways, towers, even the little flowers are cat prints. 
Alright, now we're gonna get into the more theory section of the video. In order to theorize about what this is though, we have to somewhat have an idea of the scope of this expansion. So before we get into what I think Bowser's Fury is, I need to briefly talk about how big I think Bowser's Fury will end up being. Obviously, part of this is just me hoping, but I honestly think this expansion is going to be really big. I think it honestly could end up being anywhere from a third to half the size of the main game. Well, why do I think this? Well, first of all, Nintendo opted to go with 3D World plus Bowser's Fury for this game. That actually is significant because before for ports, you could either just go with the game's name, like Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze or Captain Toad Treasure Tracker. These games barely got any new content, so they didn't really put the Deluxe moniker on them. But then you got games such as Mario Kart 8 Deluxe or New Super Mario Bros. U Deluxe, where they did get a substantial amount of new content. Obviously, Mario Kart 8 got a brand new battle mode, and New Super Mario Bros. U Deluxe got combined with New Super Luigi U, which is just an entire another campaign basically, and you got to play as Nabbit in the main campaign for the first time, on top of adding Peachette and Toadette and like that whole thing. So Deluxe seemed to be the thing for ports that would add in new content, but as you can see, that's not the case here. Initially, I thought that was just because they were only adding in Bowser's Fury and not touching the main game at all, but that couldn't be further from the truth. So much about the main game has been tweaked as well, such as the character's movement speeds, the addition of online play, the use of the cat power-up has also been changed. With so much changed in the base game, you would think they're gonna go with the deluxe moniker, but once again they opted to show off Bowser's Fury. Finally, let's get into what I actually think Bowser's Fury will end up being. As I previously stated, I think this mode will be huge. Depending on how big it ends up being, there's different theories we could go off of, but here is my initial theory for the story. This golden cat statue is some sort of deity, and Bowser, using his pure evil rage or fury, has encaptured it, as you can see with this black goop and the spikes coming out of it. Because of this, the cat deity is either sad, mad, or just not able to protect the land, hence you can make out the sad eyebrows over the cat, and that also explains why the weather is so bad in this one shot we see. Because of this, Mario's quest will entirely focus around defeating Bowser in order to get this goop stuff off this one big statue. How will he do that? Well, Mario will do what he does best and just defeat platforming levels. Yeah, not entirely sure how this actually helps the story, but obviously it's 3D World, there's gonna be some really killer platforming here. However, I don't think it's going to be open world like many other people have hypothesized. Sized. Have you ever played Splatoon, specifically Splatoon single player? The single player campaign of both the Splatoon games, but specifically Splatoon 2, holds a special place in my heart because I honestly think it's probably my favorite campaign of any shooter ever. Everything in this mode is just executed with such a childlike whimsicality. The gimmicks are creative and unique, the levels are vibrant, and the music is always very catchy. But most of all, you can just feel that Nintendo is flexing their game design muscles. As everything is intuitive, it all makes sense, the easy to follow and intuitive game design really holds down this campaign which is otherwise set in this crazy fantasy world where octopus humans roam the earth. Everything just makes sense and everything just ramps up in difficulty perfectly, in fact it reminds me of 3D World in a sense. Anyway, the single player campaign of Splatoon 2 is one that I adore and one thing I really love about it is the way it handles the hub world. The hub world in Splatoon single player is split up into different sections or worlds. Each one of these worlds can house many levels including one big boss boss level. However, you can't just enter the levels like you could in, say, 3D World's world map. Instead, the hub world itself is like a mini level. You gotta platform around here, search around, and solve these creative puzzles in order to find the tea kettles, yes, tea kettles, that allow you to enter the levels. The coolest part about this, though, is Nintendo is allowed to introduce mechanics in the hub world and teach players how to use them there in a non-stress environment, and then use those mechanics in the level that they needed to use the mechanics to unlock. Law. As I said, it's just perfect game design. They need to show that they know how to use the mechanics in order to access the level that uses the mechanics. I mean, it's perfect. On top of that, each world has a boss kettle, which you don't need to find. It's always there menacingly, but you can't access it unless you've beaten all the other levels. That is exactly how I think 3D World plus Bowser's Fury is going to be structured. In the trailer, we see three cat-themed archways, and coincidentally, we see three cat-themed lighthouses that are higher up, and each one seems to correlate with an archway. 
archway. Let's look at this first archway. It leads you up to this section, or world, quote unquote, that seems to be focused on these rotating like grid-like fences. So it seems to be relatively linear, I mean you just probably wrap around this mountain and get up to the top, but that isn't to say it's not without its secrets. I mean look at this ledge, why does this exist? There's seemingly nothing on it, so why is it even there? You can also catch this mysterious rotating grid-like fence that obscures what looks to be a hidden cave inside this pillar. Places like these are where these levels are going to be hidden. These levels could even use the grid-like fences that we see in the overworld. I mean, it would make sense just from a game design standpoint. On top of that, each final boss or final level, what have you, could be located within these lighthouses. I mean, it seems to be at the end of the road for this specific world. This Splatoon-like approach I'm talking about also makes sense in the terms of, like, just what normal 3D world is. A pretty cool part of 3D world was that game's hub world. It didn't really have one per se, but in the overworld maps, you could actually just walk around and sometimes you could like find a little cave or something off to the side that would have like, I don't know, a hidden level or something, or you could find like those slot machines or mushroom houses. It was pretty cool, somewhat interactive, and a nice way to kind of bridge the gap between level to level. However, it was certainly not without its faults. If you were playing in multiplayer, only player one could control anything. On top of that, there was really minimal stuff to do, and it was kind of jarring because Mario controlled different here, obviously he was, you know, couldn't really do much at all. Within Bowser's Fury, I think Nintendo is finally fully realizing that hub world dream they had within the base game. The hub world is now going to be fully interactable and essentially be a mini level within itself, exactly like they did in Splatoon. Let me know if you guys enjoyed this video. I had to re-record parts of it for so long because I just rambled on and on and on about this game. If you want to hear me talk about it even more, then check out our podcast Nintendo Tonight. Like, we've literally done episodes where I just talk about 3D World and we likely will do more by the time the game releases. So just check that channel out. It'll be linked on screen right now. Like the video if you did enjoy, subscribe if you're new, and with that out of the way, I'm Thomas from the Switch Stop signing off. Peace.